There was like two Ed Geens. There was the one that was out there during the day, and then there was the one at night that was digging up the grave. Every time you would call the office with some new detail, it got bigger and bigger. Among the things they found were bowls that had been made from the tops of human skulls. Things like this just don't happen in the 1950s in a small town like Plainfield. It's not the nature of man to do the things that he did. It's an aberration. For more than a century, the movies have brought our most vivid nightmares to life. Often, the fear is conjured from fantasy, from imagining the unimaginable. But it's even more frightening when the demons are real. Based on a true story, just that small phrase that these events actually happened sort of makes the film much more both relevant and much more terrifying. Norman Bates in Psycho, Leatherface in the Texas Chainsaw Massacre, Buffalo Bill in The Silence of the Lambs. Each of these characters had its origins in the same true story, the unspeakable crimes of a single man. His name was Ed Gein. The writers of fiction, who are really good at it, could take Ed Gein and you could make him almost to anything you wanted to make him in, in the world of horror, because he had so much to work with. Gein's crimes were committed against the living and the dead. The depraved acts of a damaged mind, they slashed through the surface of a complacent age, revealing the darkness that lurked just below. His twisted world became America's obsession. And what is at bottom, the story of a boy and his mother, became the template for half a century of horror. There's something about Gein that appeals to the morbid curiosity within all of us. It's so macabre, so bizarre, so deviant that we can't look away. How long have you known Mr. Gein? Seven years. Seven years. What kind of a man did you know him as? Well, a man is a nice man, just like anybody else. The only difference I'd say in a man, he seems to be a little odd. No one ever claimed that Plainfield, Wisconsin was a small town paradise. In the fall of 1957, it was home to about 700 people, a quiet, hardworking place on the windswept flatlands of central Wisconsin. They had the main hardware store for that area, a food market. They had a, a restaurant or two, a saloon. There was nothing that would distinguish it from, you know, probably a hundred other communities in Wisconsin. That all changed over the course of one cold weekend with a mysterious disappearance and a shocking discovery. Saturday, November 16th, marked the beginning of an annual Wisconsin ritual. Deer season. In Plainfield, the men hunted not for sport, but for food. Their trophies would be killed, hung in barns, and dressed out, gutted and butchered. All the males would be uh, uh, out in the woods. And so uh, the main street would uh, be a quiet place. Particularly quiet that morning was Bernice Warden's hardware store. Though the store was supposed to be open, the 58-year-old proprietor was nowhere to be found. I lived across the street from the hardware store where Bernice Warden ran her business. I believe it was in the afternoon. People were starting to wonder where, why the store was locked and um, where was Bernice Warden. So her son came back from deer hunting himself and found that the place was a mess. There was blood all over the floor, and they started to investigate what might have possibly happened to her. 
Interviewed by police, Bernice Warden's son mentioned a frequent customer who'd been in just the day before to check on the price of antifreeze. Ed Gein, a 51-year-old bachelor who lived in an isolated farmhouse outside of town. Everybody had a role to play in this town. And uh, I think that Ed Gein was recognized probably not as the village idiot, but as a village uh, oddball, oddball, I would say. That evening, about two hours after Bernice Warden was reported missing, Sheriff Arch Sly headed out with another deputy to Ed Gein's farm. If you ever wanted to have a Halloween party, that would be a great place for it. It was a, it was a spooky house out in the edge of town, and it uh, was dark, and there wasn't a sign of life there. The doors of the house were locked, so the officers decided to take a look inside the woodshed. They went in investigating with flashlights. It was pitch black because there was no electricity and no lights. And one of the lawmen felt something bump against his shoulder. He turned, shined his flashlight on it, and indeed, there was Bernice Warden hanging from the rafters, upside down with her head off and gutted like a deer. Ed Gein was taken into custody that night. As he sat quietly in his cell at the Washara County Jail, police continued to search his woodshed and then cautiously ventured into his home. Inside, they would discover a horrific scene. Bernice Warden's gutted carcass, it turned out, was only Ed Gein's latest grim creation. On November 16, 1957, the quiet farming town of Plainfield, Wisconsin, was abuzz with rumors about the murder of one of its residents. Bernice Warden's mutilated and decapitated corpse had been found that night in the woodshed of 51-year-old Ed Gein. With Gein now in custody, police prepared to enter his house for the first time. It was a cold, dark night, and the place had no electricity. The officers had only lanterns and flashlights to illuminate the scene. Well, Gein's entire house was in a state of really unimaginable squalor. It was so completely, completely overwhelmed with the trash of a decade. It was chaos in, in, in terms of, of housekeeping. Well, you don't keep house, you just, it was, the kitchen was a jumble. Everything, you know, there was dirty things here and, and newspapers laid up here and, and junk all over the place. But the officers discovered much more than mere filth. In plain sight, scattered throughout the house, was a ghastly array of human remains. Investigators were completely stunned and appalled to discover this incredible collection of human body objects. Uh, and among the things they found were, were bowls that had been made from the tops of human skulls. And then they found what looked, looked like trinkets, but it was like a string of, of nipples from breasts all on a string. They found uh, a shade pole that was made from uh, a set of women's lips. And they had found other body parts there. Then you'd go out into what would be like a living room, and they found furniture, a lampshade that uh, was, was made out of human skin, uh, chairs that were upholstered in human skin. They found face masks. Gein had apparently flayed the skin from the, uh, from the heads of the victims and preserved them and stuffed them with paper and hung them on the wall as decorations. <laughs> Each disturbing discovery seemed to top the previous one, until finally, one officer came upon a brown paper bag. He opened the paper bag and saw a hank of human hair, and as he himself later described it, he said he had no idea what possessed him to do it, but just sort of reflexively, he reached in and pulled this thing out. 
To his horror, he discovered it was a woman's face. Worse yet, it was someone the cops recognized, a local bar owner named Mary Hogan, who had gone missing three years before. For 30 hours, the man apparently responsible for this gruesome spectacle sat in his jail cell, refusing to speak to investigators. Finally, they confronted him with Bernice Warden's corpse. And with that, Ed Gein began to come clean. He was perfectly happy to cooperate with the police. You know, all he asked for was a slice of apple pie with some cheddar cheese on top of it. And according to the investigator, Ed ate the thing. And after that, he told them anything they wanted to know. They said, well, what's all those body? What's all these body parts in here, Ed? You know, how many people did you kill? All the dead stuff in his house, they just assumed that it was like murder victims. All told, Gein would confess to only two killings, Bernice Warden and Mary Hogan. The rest of his grisly artifacts, he said, were crafted from corpses he had stolen from local cemeteries. Plainfield woke up that Sunday morning to find out what had been living in their community for all these years, and that was Ed Gein. My dad, he couldn't tell us what had happened. He just said, I want you to come in and watch the news tonight with me. And the news came up on the television. He was the person. I just said to my dad, oh my gosh, that's Ed. We were all upset. We were all devastated. We were horrified about what had happened. It was a terrible, horrible thing. It was just such a complete shock, I guess. It was a, something that was a little bit difficult to talk about. It wasn't just the murder of Bernice Warden that was so disturbing. It was the other terrible things that he did that was upsetting so many people. I mean, this is a guy who had been living in their community almost all his life and been a babysitter for their children, had been e eating at their table. Well, look what he did and how he did They couldn't believe it. Well, I figured he was just perfectly harmless. Mm -hmm. well, well, Plainfield's shock would soon be America's. Almost immediately, hordes of reporters descended on the town. It was the beginning of Ed Gein's transformation from anonymous psychotic to cultural icon. And it could all be traced back to the story of his childhood. Because in the words of Norman Bates, a boy's best friend is his mother. In November 1957, the gruesome tale of Ed Gein was making headlines across America. The country's morbid fascination with the man the papers were calling the Mad Butcher of Plainfield was not lost on author Robert Block, who was living in Wisconsin at the time. It was exactly the time that the Gein case was breaking in the newspapers, and Block immediately recognized that it would be a wonderful basis for a horror story. The result was Block's 1959 novel, Psycho, which Alfred Hitchcock would bring to the big screen the following year. The story of Psycho is the story of Norman Bates, a single, deeply disturbed mama's boy, for lack of a better word, who runs a hotel and murders unsuspecting young women who cause him to have any sexual urges or impulses. One of the main things that Block took from the Gein case was the psychological relationship between uh, Norman and his mother, which very much parallels that between Annie and his mother. Augusta Gein had been dead 12 years when police entered the house she had once shared with her son. As they worked their way from room to room, searching for clues that might explain what would drive someone to commit such crimes, they came upon a doorway that had been boarded up 
And by that time, of course, they had seen so many horrific things, they had no idea what they were going to discover behind the doors of this room. And when they broke it down, what they discovered was that it was a room that was kept in a state of perfect, pristine preservation. And that turned out to be uh, the room of Ed's mother. The bed was made. Uh, there was a table, night table. Uh, I had a Bible on it. The room was very dusty, musty. The wallpaper was sort of a rose tinted thing, but it was all kind of discolored. And uh, that was his shrine to his mother. After his arrest, Ed Gein underwent a month-long court-ordered psychological evaluation. It was here that a picture began to emerge of life behind closed doors on the Plainfield farm and Ed Gein's descent into madness. Born in 1906 in La Crosse, Wisconsin, Edward Theodore Gein was the son of an alcoholic grocery store owner and a strong-willed, God-fearing housewife. When he was eight, his mother Augusta insisted that the family leave their La Crosse home. One reason, apparently, she insisted that the family move from La Crosse was because, in her mind, you know, it was like Sodom and Gomorrah. With the proceeds from the sale of their grocery store, the Gein family settled on to a 200-acre farm in Plainfield. Isolated, the family dynamic grew stranger and stranger. Mr. Gein had a very strange relationship with his mother. It was a love-hate relationship. He listened to her and worshipped her and followed her very closely. She was a religiously devout, if not fanatical woman. Very, very domineering, very, very strong-willed. I mean, she completely dominated her husband, as well as her two sons, uh, Gein and his brother Henry. Augusta would uh, preach a lot out of the Book of Revelations that said that women were whores, women were tramps, women were definitely evil beings out to, you know, hurt people. The Gein household really became a sort of breeding ground for psychopathology. You know, you have these four people stuck together, completely under the sway of this woman so it really becomes an incubation place for madness. Dean attended school until the age of 14. An unremarkable student, his IQ would later be tested as average. And when he finished school at approximately seventh grade, uh, he just went home then and worked on the farm there. So he did not have contact uh, with the outside world, shall we say, to any extent. In 1940, when Ed was 34, his father died of a heart attack. Now it was just Ed, mother, and older brother Henry. I think Henry was probably a genteel man who worked hard on the farm and tried to please his mother as well. But he wasn't Ed. He had his own ideas of how his life should be led. In May 1944, Henry and Ed found themselves battling a brush fire on their property. According to Ed, the fire got out of control and he lost sight of his brother. He went for the police. And though he told them he didn't know where Henry was, he was able to lead them straight to his brother's dead body. I've heard rumors that there were bruises on Henry's head that weren't ever explained away. But at the time, it was such a big tragedy for the family, it just became, uh, you know, well, they've already been through enough. Ed and mother were now alone, but their union would be short-lived. Just months after burying her son, Henry, Augusta suffered a stroke that left her partially paralyzed. When mother became ill, had a stroke, and was paralyzed, he cared for her very closely and literally seemingly worshipped the ground she walked on. Sometime in 1945, Augusta Gein suffered another stroke. She died that December, a devastating blow to her 39-year-old son. His mother had 
completely undermined his manhood in every way. And uh, at her funeral, he was reacting like a little schoolboy who had just lost his mommy, you know, and just crying hysterically. Everything that he knew in the world seemingly was gone. That was his one link with sanity that was remaining at that point. Until 1945, Ed Gein's world had been entirely defined by his deeply religious and domineering mother. Her death that December left him for the first time on his own. Living alone in an isolated farmhouse outside Plainfield, Wisconsin, the 39-year-old earned money by helping the townspeople with odd jobs or working on threshing crews. From the time I was uh, pretty small, Eddie Gein was always just, you know, part of the crew. From where our farm was, he was uh, about two and a half miles away is all, and we'd get in the car and go over and see Eddie. We'd pull into his yard, and I can still remember doing that, and Eddie would always come out and talk to us in the yard. So we never was in his house or anything like that. He was not the, you know, the village idiot. That was for sure. The housewives in town, they, they would trust him. You know, can you fix this? I got a door that squeaks at, or, you know, can you fix the hinge on my door? Sure, I come over. He was a hard worker. When you paid him a dollar, you had a dollar and a half worth of work out of him. I mean, he didn't slack off. He wouldn't screw anything up. I think that everybody treated him, even though he was uh, maybe a little, what you'd think a little different, uh, but Eddie was Eddie. Oftentimes, when the threshing crews broke for lunch, the women would provide them with meals. When you listen now, the women uh, that would talk about it, they felt kind of funny when Ed would look at them. There was, he would give off kind of a funny, uh, it made them uncomfortable the way he would stare at them. Something about his eyes that bothered me. I didn't feel like he was a person I would trust. Strange. Gein had a reputation around town as odd, yet harmless. Behind closed doors, however, he struggled to cope with life after mother. Psychiatrists who interviewed Gein concluded that during the years after his mother's death, his psychological problems crossed the line into psychosis. Mr. Gein's mother as deaths affected him tremendously. He had no other person to communicate with or talk with. And uh, consequently, uh, he just turned to his inner fantasies, his other interests, and found that uh, without mother, uh, he didn't know what he was going to be doing. He would come home to this empty, uh, decaying farmhouse. Again, that was without electricity. Um, that was without indoor plumbing. Uh, he, he was completely, completely isolated. Gein's mother had left him terrified of human contact, of women in particular. His loneliness, however, drove him to seek his own perverse sort of companionship. At some point, Gein said, he began to make nighttime raids on local cemeteries. Ed was a uh, reader of the obituaries. He was fascinated by who had just passed away. Ed would find out when the service was going to be, uh, where the burial was going to be, and as quickly as he could get there in the dark of night, he would go and open that grave and get that body. Mr. Gein substituted seemingly dead bodies for the activities that he had with his live mother before. If mother was gone, he needed someone who literally could take her place. Gein took these desires to ghoulish extremes though it remains a mystery if he ever engaged in either sex with the corpses or cannibalism, some of the discoveries police would later make defied comprehension. There was a, what the police called a mammary vest, the upper torso of a woman uh, that Gein had taken from the body and preserved and attached straps to. And then there were leggings that had been made from the uh, skin of a woman's legs. And at times, uh, it was reported that uh, he would sometimes walk around with this mammary vest that he had 
uh, managed to make from female anatomy, and he would uh, attach it to his body. And uh, apparently also sometimes take one of the uh, uh, female genitals that he had removed from a corpse and, and stick those on himself as well and pretend to be a woman. Eventually, however, violating the dead was not enough to satisfy Gein's morbid urges. It was around this time that he began patronizing Hogan's Tavern, a local watering hole owned by the bawdy, tough-talking Mary Hogan. That was one bar that hunters would, you know, after you hunt long all day, you generally stop and have a soda pop. And I recall she was very huge and very jovial and joked a lot. Her nickname was Bloody Mary. Mary Hogan was uh, indeed a dirty talker. She spoke in profanity like a truck driver or a sailor or whatnot. I think uh, when Ed Gein saw Mary Hogan, he, he saw some kind of grotesque, dark mirror image of his mother. On the afternoon of December 8th, 1954, a local farmer stopped into Hogan's Tavern to pick up some ice cream for his daughter. He goes into the bar, and he knew immediately that something was wrong. There was blood all over the floor, and there was money on the floor, and he just turned around and beat it out of there. Mary Hogan was nowhere to be found. When Mary Hogan turned up missing, there was talk about, they said they felt she'd been murdered, and she just was missing, and they just could not find her to go to heck for it. Police explored what few leads they had. Ed Gein was never questioned. No one considered him a suspect. It was too far-fetched to imagine that the quiet, hard-working bachelor could possibly be a killer. I can still remember uh, somebody said, well, I wonder where Mary Hogan is. Boy, he said, she's over by my place. He said, I got her over there. And everybody said, ah, oh, yeah, Eddie, you got her. Yeah, we know Eddie, yeah. As the leads petered out, it started to look like Mary Hogan's disappearance would remain unsolved. Until the night of November 16th, 1957, when police found her face in a paper bag in Ed Gein's kitchen. Maybe he felt he wanted to incorporate her into his home, and this was his way of bringing home a bride. But he brought her home as a corpse. As 1957 drew to a close, the people of Plainfield, Wisconsin, were still reeling from the nightmare visited on their town. Ed Gein had been charged with the murder of hardware store owner Bernice Warden. But the discovery of his many other hideous offenses had brought instant infamy to Plainfield, along with a horde of reporters from around the world. This was the crime of the country at this particular November in 1957, and it, it had just brought in basically uh, the, the Western world's press. Had you ever been in the man's house? No, sir. Never been in there. I'd like to talk now. Your name? As the incident wore on and it became so much a front page uh, issue that uh, lots and lots of people were saying, when can it just die down? When can it go away? It was disturbing to the population. We didn't really appreciate all of the media attention. I was stopped on the street once by a reporter from England, but um, I just said that I had nothing to say, no comments to make, and walked on. <laughs> Outside of Plainfield, a different kind of response was taking hold, the spread of what came to be known as Gein humor. Well, I believe that the jokes sort of was an outlet for um, how everyone felt and the fear that they felt. One of them was, what, what was Ed's favorite dessert? And he says, lady fingers. Ed Gein gave his girlfriend a present on Valentine's Day. It was a box of farmer's fannies, you know. <laughs> uh, there were actually people thrown out of the restaurant and playing fuel for going and ordering Gein burgers and things. Just a, a whole spectrum of those kinds of, of, of sick humor jokes that uh, 
uh, you couldn't think about fast enough to, to respond to the, the one that would be given to you. On January 6, 1958, hearings began to determine if Ed Gein was competent to stand trial for Bernice Warden's murder. Doctors who had evaluated Gein testified that he suffered from schizophrenia. They said he was prone to hallucinations and delusional thinking and believed he was an instrument of God with the power to raise the dead. You know, he'll talk about the most incredible, extraordinary horrors that are totally inconceivable to any normal person, but he does it in the tone as though he's talking about going to the grocery, you know, to buy his provisions for the week. In the end, the doctor said it all came back to mother. This is the duality of Gein. You know, part of it was a desire to, to have the physical presence of his mother back with him in that home, whereas obviously another part of the motivation had to do with desecrating the corpse. Reporter Dick Leonard remembers sitting next to Gein as the sanity hearing drew to a close. At that moment, he says, he caught a glimpse of the scared, sick man behind the monster. I looked at Ed, and he looked at me, and I, I could see he was, he was nervous. He, he, he was fearful. And uh, he says to me, what are they going to do to me? What are they going to do to me? So the judge raps and everybody to be quiet. And uh, I had my hand down on the bench here, and he's, uh, he's next to me. And he reaches over and grabs my hand like, uh, like uh, I was his mother or something. That afternoon, the judge ruled that Ed Gein was legally insane and therefore not competent to stand trial. He was sent off to live at Central State Hospital for the Criminally Insane, a psychiatric hospital in central Wisconsin. For the people of Plainfield, life after Ed Gein would never be the same. We never locked our doors before this happened. Uh, but we began to lock our doors. The 50s was an era of innocence, I believe, and it's pretty much ended that. Still, there was one last piece of business for the town to attend to. On March 30th, 1958, Palm Sunday, Gein's farm and personal effects were scheduled to be auctioned off. But in the early morning hours of March 20th, residents awoke to a strange orange haze glowing a few miles out of town. There will be an auction here Palm Sunday, but this house and the personal belongings of Ed Gein will be conspicuously absent. Call it an act of God or whatever you will. The main attraction will be missing reduced to a mass of rubble by a mysterious fire. News of the fire reached Gein himself later that morning. I went to Ed's room and I, I told him that his house had burned down. And uh, he made a gesture just as well, the exact words that he said. In the end, after a brief investigation, the cause of the blaze remained a mystery. Residents of Plainfield were just happy the place was gone. The people in Plainfield were so happy that this house burned down and this was going to go away. We weren't going to be bombarded by the media. We were not going to be having tourists come to Plainfield to see Ed Gein's horror house. The auction of Ed Gein's estate still took place as scheduled on March 30th. Gein's grisly handiwork was not up for sale. All the human remains had been shipped off to the Wisconsin State Crime Lab. Yet that didn't stop hundreds of curiosity seekers from descending on the farm. One of the things sold at the auction was Ed Gein's car, which a very enterprising carny type immediately purchased and started to uh, take on tour uh, Ed Gein's car uh, used to show up at uh, county fairs, like an exhibit, you know, like the two-headed cow or, you know, uh, the bearded person. 
so that uh, that would be an exhibit that you could put a tent around it and charge admission. At Central State Hospital, staffers soon came to view Ed Gein as something of a model patient. Ed was a quiet individual. He'd go and sit in the corner in the day room. And, uh, we had some nice lounge chairs out there. and He'd read the paper there. And, uh, he wouldn't converse too much with other, other patients. I can remember we used to play cribbage together out in the day room. There were, however, times when Gein behaved oddly. When it got, say, full moon, he would talk about women, what he'd like to do to them, and just ramble on and on, just like very incoherent. And then as the uh, full moon dissipated, he would get more back to normal. But uh, he always had that glint in his eye that uh, you kind of figured there was something there that was wrong. In 1968, Gein's doctors wrote a letter to the court stating that Gein was now competent to stand trial for the murder of Bernice Warden. When he walked into the courtroom, there was dead silence. It was just, I mean, you could hear a pin drop. And then he, he walked in and he stopped a little bit and he bowed his head to the uh, audience. <laughs> After a nine-day trial, the judge found him guilty. The 62-year-old was sent back to Central State to live out the rest of his days. In time, Ed Gein's macabre fame would fade, yet his twisted saga would never lose its capacity to shock or its power to provoke our deepest fears. By the early 1970s, an aging Ed Gein was quietly passing his days in a Wisconsin mental institution. He'd go to his room a lot and lay on the bed and uh, kind of daydream. So I don't know what he was thinking about. I couldn't read his mind, but we, we always had the thought that he was thinking about what he had done. Gein and his gruesome crimes had long since faded from the public consciousness. Yet the story of the so-called mad butcher of Plainfield had firmly taken root in the darkest reaches of the American psyche. It was a time where he became almost unlifelike, almost like he was a, a creature of fiction, I think. Uh, some type of a demigod, almost. My name is Gunnar Hansen. In 1973, I killed four people. I was Leatherface in the Texas Chainsaw Massacre. When Texas Chainsaw Massacre was released, it played predominantly in drive-ins. And to say there was a, an uproar over it would be an understatement. You know, teenagers went in their cars looking for a good time. And what they were uh, exposed to was literally 90 minutes of pure hell. Directed by Toby Hooper, the film featured a character named Leatherface, who wore a mask made of human skin. During the filming, late one night, Toby told me that this was based on Ed Gein, uh, very loosely. I mean, what he said was that Ed Gein was the inspiration for the family, that if you take, essentially, the fact that they made furniture out of bones, that they had skin lamps, uh, that they might be cannibals, and that Leatherface wore a mask, those characteristics were lifted from Ed Gein. What Leatherface really is, is Ed Gein as a little child would imagine him to be. Because these crimes were real, we had to make Leatherface into this hulking monster who wears a mask of human flesh and wields a chainsaw. Instead of being the boy next door who, who does these horrible things. 17 years later, a different take on the legend of Ed Gein would help make the film The Silence of the Lambs a critical and commercial hit. If you look at The Silence of the Lambs, where the Buffalo Bill character is trying to make a, a skin suit out of women's body parts, which is something that's based directly on Gein. The killer, the grave robber, all of the things that, you know, you want to get into a good horror story, he was there. He was their source because the imagination could take Ed Gein anywhere, 
and, uh, and, it, and it has. The irony is that as twisted as Norman Bates was, as terrifying as Leatherface wielding his chainsaw is, and as pathologically insane as Buffalo Bill is, Gein was worse. Gein had everything these characters had in spades. 2001 saw the release of a low-budget independent film about the life of Ed Gein. I thought Ed Gein would be a good topic for a movie just because of the mindset of this person, uh, this, this person who lives by himself with his fantasies and with just his loneliness and his mental illness, eventually steps over the line and becomes a killer. <laughs> On July 26, 1984, Ed Gein died of respiratory failure. He was 77 years old. There wasn't too much emotion at that time. There wasn't much talk going on in town other than he's gone, he's dead. Ed Gein ended up being buried in the most uh, appropriate place for him, right next to his mother in the Plainfield Cemetery. You know, ever since her own death in 1945, uh, it had been his, his great dream to, to get back to her. And uh, finally in death, he, he had achieved that. Sometime after his death, Ed Gein's tombstone was stolen from the ground. It was eventually recovered and is currently being kept in storage at the Washara County Sheriff's Department. To this day, however, groundskeepers at Plainfield Cemetery still find flowers and letters that have been left at his grave. There's no way in the world that anyone could ever decipher completely or even uh, intelligently what Ed was thinking or doing. It's not the nature of man to do the things that he did. It's, uh, it's, it's an aberration. The fact that Ed Gein was a sick man mentally, I don't think that mattered to any of us. He did some horrible things, no matter what his condition was, and so we had no sympathy for the man. Mr. Gein was an example of a monster that was in hiding. He was not known to his neighbors. He presented a facade of normality to them. And that's why he literally could have the mask of sanity over the whole situation until he was discovered. Obviously, we can never really know. To ask what made Ed Gein Ed Gein is ultimately as unknowable as to ask what made Mozart Mozart. You just don't know. Thank you.